What's up, Mission? How we doing? Good morning. Okay. Whew. Good. Whew. Got nervous there. Uh, welcome, welcome. My name is Mike Hickerson. I'm honored to be the lead pastor of Mission Church. If you're hanging out online or on the patio or in, in the lobby, welcome, welcome, welcome. Honored that Mission's a part of your weekend. We exist as a church to help people find and follow Jesus. That's what we're going after. Um, th- uh, there's a few things that are true about the people that are in this room. First of all, there are no perfect people here. Um, Online, there may be some perfect people. Um, I'm sure there is. Uh, everything I see online, it seems to be perfect. Um, so, uh, but there are no perfect people in this room or in this lobby or on the patio. So it's helpful to remind each other of that. If you're new here, this, this isn't meant to be offensive. So sorry about that. But somebody's going to look at you, and I want you to look at somebody that you're sitting next to. Hopefully, you've met them already, and you're nice. Um, and you just look at them and be like, hey, I just want to remind you something, that you are not perfect. So just look at the person next to you. Tell them that. That'd be great. You are not perfect. They're going to look at you, they're going to be offended, and they're going to be like, well, you're not perfect either. You know, that's the way it goes. Fights will break out. Uh, All right, all right. Don't enjoy that too much. There's something wrong deeply if you enjoy that too much. We don't mean this, like, this is not a great thing to do later when you're in actual conflict to remind each other of each other's imperfections. And it's not meant to be a weapon or shame-inducing. This is actually meant to be like, hey, None of us are perfect, and, and without Jesus, we're all sunk. And, and so w- there's a perfect God who rescues and saves. So if there's no perfect people, then we need a perfect God who sent his perfect son into the mess. That on our worst day, we would have the, be right, the right to be restored as much love sons and daughters. There's no perfect people, but there is a God who rescues and saves. And that, then change is possible. Like, we don't have to stay stuck in the same hurts or habits or hang that have gotten us where we are. That God has given us everything that we need to live the life that he's called us to. He's given us himself. He's given us his, his son, Jesus. He's given us his Holy Spirit that transforms us from the inside out. He's given us his word that like, transforms our mind and, and transforms our heart. And he's given us this imperfect body of the church together. He's also given us gifts that he's in, in, in inspired us with and gifted us with to be able to be good news where we live, work, and play. God literally has given us everything that we need to live the life that he's called us to. So change is possible. We don't have to stay stuck. And that means that anyone is welcome into this and that there's hope for every single one of us. We're big believers in hope around here, that confident expectation that God is both willing and able to do everything that he promised to do for those who love him. Like he's not bailed on you no matter what you're walking in with. He's not distanced from you no matter what you feel like in the moment. That there's hope for us, not just in the today, but in the tomorrow. And there's actually hope for our past to be restored and rescued. And our future can be free. And we've been in this series where we're like, man, let's just talk about it. Let's bring some practical help and some practical hope to stuff that we don't talk about too much. When where is God in the midst of the weeds in my garden? Like we present like the idea of the series. If you're like, why are we talking about weed in church? That feels a little awkward. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you'll get that later. Um, but it's like this idea, like we present this Instagram or we present roses to everybody or this cleaned up life. But we actually have stuff going on in the back or in our heart or in our soul that we don't really talk about or we don't want people to see. So the first week of this series, we were like, man, we've got to get honest with each other and with God. Like uh, sometimes like it's okay not to be okay. It's okay. We don't want to be hypofine reacts. Like, how are you? Fine. How are you? Fine. Like your world's falling apart. You ain't fine. But we just want to tell everybody we're fine. So we got to get honest first. And then we talked about anxiety and worry which you were probably worried that somebody else next to you had it and that you didn't, but anxiety and worry and then stress and burnout. And today we're going to talk about grief and loss. And next week is we'll talk about suicide and self-harm. So just one caveat, that may be um, a great time to check out Mission Kids. If you have kids um, under fifth grade, it's an awesome experience in there. Screens and scripts. And then we're going to end it with Hope Sunday. We're going to do some baptisms. It's going to be incredible. I'm so excited for Hope Sunday. But we said as we're kind of jumping into grief and loss and what we kind of set as some parameters for this series is that it's not simple. And we try to sometimes oversimplify it. And mental health gets put into four buckets. And if you try to solve or try to fix someone else, which is always a good plan, or try to fix yourself out of the wrong bucket, um, it can do some harm. And so we said there's like this situational bucket where life just hits you in the face and you didn't cause it or didn't plan it. It just all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation that you had no control of. Like the Thomas fire or maybe your parents divorced or like something happens at work or you get laid off. You just are in this situation and it trips you or triggers you or all of a sudden you fall into some mental health things that maybe you've never experienced before and you don't know quite what to do with it. And then there's this biological 
like bucket, like there's actually things where our body chemistry changes or things go on in our body. And then there's this clinical where like we need somebody from the outside that will help us kind of diagnose or treat. And I'm not talking about your neighbor's best friend, or I'm not talking about TikTok on the outside to help you diagnose what's going on or WebMD, because something's always wrong with you if you go to WebMD. But this idea that you get a trusted friend, a, 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 a counselor, um, a psychiatrist, somebody that's going to help diagnose, treat, um, prescribe, uh, like a like as the blues last too long that will help you in that bucket. And then there's the spiritual bucket. And so we said most of us, like, and I'm probably most qualified in the spiritual bucket. Um, I'm not qualified in, the, in any of the other buckets to help anybody with their mental health thing, but well-meaning Christians will try to solve everyone else around them's mental health problems with the spiritual bucket. And sometimes we give terrible advice and do harm. You with me? So we said it's not simple. It's a little bit complicated, and let's make sure we're just showing up for people in the mess. And we want to be honest with each other and make sure that there's four buckets and let everybody kind of go on that journey together. So today we're going to talk about grief and loss, which is something that all of us are going to deal with or have dealt with in our life. But we don't talk about it very much. And so I asked my friend, Dr. Paul Linderman, if he would join me this weekend. And so he's going to help us talk about it and figure out how to get some help and hope with it. Will you help welcome him to the stage? So Dr. Paul Linderman. Thank you, dude. Thanks for being here. Am I going to have to call you doctor the whole time? No, please call me Paul. Okay. Please All right. call me Paul. So the doctor of, like, tell me, like, of what? So give me the, give me the. So my background is theology, but the specialty is going to be in thanatology and grief counseling. So I, I'm, this may be the only funny part that we get to do together because that just immediately makes me think of Thanos. Um, so if you snap your fingers, we could all be in deep trouble right here. And if you don't know what that joke is, I'm sorry. Just ask your kids. They'll know. They'll know. All right. So like, where does that come from? Like, what is that? So thanatology it comes from the Greek word thanatos, which means death. And so a thanatologist is someone who does the scientific study of a dying person and the losses associated with that, which would be grief and the change in adjustment that follows. So how do you, how do you get in, how does that happen? Like, how do you get into that? Well, my story goes back to just reviewing the losses that I've experienced in my own life. And, you know, from my first little cat dying when I was just about five years old, and then moving. I'm really refraining from making a joke right here. So, so it's good. So sorry. So, I was fine. I did, I, good. Fine. I did so good. I did so good. And then moving forward, uh, my grandfather passed away mm. on February 10th, 1986, uh, as a 10 year old boy, just trying to understand what that was like. Moving on, had another friend in uh, school that was killed in a motorcycle accident, mm. then another friend that committed suicide or completed suicide, as we say. And then Moving forward with that, probably the one that really propelled me to really specialize in this was on March the 1st, 2018. Uh, I was talking with my younger brother on the phone, and he, he had been encouraging me to start a nonprofit organization here in Ventura County because I was already doing some grief counseling, some spiritual guidance, and a little bit of music therapy even. And he just encouraged me to do that, and he said, I'll be the first one to support you. I'm going to send you $300 to start this nonprofit to really help people navigate through grief and loss in these other areas. So I agreed to it on that Thursday morning, March 1st, 2018. I drove up to Ojai to help a cancer recovery center start a group. And about an hour and a half later after that call with my brother, uh, I found out that he had died from a sudden heart attack. Mm. Uh, 40 years old, left a wife and three kids, 14, 12, and 10, and mm. that really changed everything and kind of the focus. So I took a year off and kind of went to a couple of groups myself and tried to process grief and not make any major decisions, as we normally suggest, not to make any major ones in the first 12 months or so. And then on the one-year anniversary, we started the nonprofit organization, and we named it after my brother Mark. Mm. Uh, so it's called Mark Ministries, and that really propelled me into fo focusing on that. And so many people have come our way over the years, uh, just really helping people through this difficult yeah. time. Yeah, you've been an incredible friend of mission for a long, long time. It goes back to the theater days. So yeah, yeah. Exactly. I've been super grateful for that. So as we jump, jump into it, like, so how many funerals would you say in a like last year did you do? Last year, I officiated 120 in one year in Ventura County, a little bit, one in, a couple in Santa Barbara and L.A., but mainly Ventura County. Okay, and so you're very used to helping people navigate this process and families navigate this process. And so give me some of the other things on like some of the grief workshops and grief 
groups and even yeah some of the yeah. stuff you're involved in. Yeah, so last year, just to sum it up, um, I facilitated 188 bereavement support groups and um, about 350 one-on-one -on -one grief counseling sessions. So really just involved in it. That's in churches, that's in senior living facilities, which is a whole nother area of grief and loss homes and on Zoom and all that kind of stuff. So just really surrounded with it. And in those in end of life, like a hospice situation even. So I, this is not always the easiest conversation and because most of us want to not lean into it, but how does, how does grief and law, how does it work? Like, um, I know we've ex all experienced it. We don't like to talk about it, but like maybe help me understand. Yeah, so we have a loss. Now it's important to remember that a loss is not just a person that passes away. It could be a pet, um, cat, dog, a bird. Um, it could be anything that is of value to you. So grief is the natural reaction to any loss of significant value. So it could be a person who lost a house in the Thomas fire. It could be somebody who, who lost their eyesight or their ability to walk. Uh, it could be obviously a relationship, um, any number, a dream job, any, anything mm -hmm. like that. Those are losses, and what we find is when you have a loss, it can come one of two ways. It can come suddenly, but it can also come slowly. And we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow night, but those losses, when they come, the reaction to that loss is called grief. Mm -hmm. And grief has been called, um, you know, the price we pay for love, according mm -hmm. to Queen Elizabeth II. And so when we have that reaction, we usually go into kind of five stages well, of grief ask, and loss. Let me too. ask this, because I want to know the stages, but... Does every loss have some level of grief or does, or does, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or is, so there's always grief attached to some loss, even if it's minuscule. Yeah, so, okay. exactly. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, you can, there can be different levels depending on the relationship, the connection, the time spent with that person or that thing or how valuable it is to you. It can be a different reaction. So it can be kind of a low, mild, or what we call high risk. And so I could look at you, and you're probably going to correct me for what I just did about your cat earlier, but I can look at you and feel like that should be a, a small grief because it's a little loss. But for you as a five-year-old, it felt like a huge grief because it was a huge loss. And I could be insensitive by making a joke about it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. I appreciate I'm a, I'm that. I'm offended. So. I'll be. I'll forgive you in a couple okay. Of weeks. Okay. Real good. good. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. So that, that, how does so how does the how does it work on the stages? So in 1969, Elizabeth Kubler Ross started what we call the grief and loss model, and um, she was a psychiatrist dealing with end of life patients and seeing that. So she wrote kind of the five stages of dying, which now we translate to the five stages of grieving. It's kind of easy to remember. We call it DABDA, D-A-B-D-A. -D -A. You have denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And each one of those uh, reactions or stages is very important for us to understand. Because once you get the news that somebody has passed or they're taken from you, the brain goes in, in kind of a denial and shock mode of like, wow, this happened? How do, you know, we kind of process and we ask the questions. We can't, we can't believe it. Mm -hmm. That happens. So we go into the denial. It's actually the, the mind and the body's way to kind of survive the shocking news. Then we can go into what's called anger. And anger may be the one that most people get stuck in because anger goes into so many different directions. Anger towards God, ourselves, the person who passed, family, friends, doctors, nurses, whatever. And so we become ang angry towards that. And sometimes we're just angry at the whole situation and we do what's called displaced anger and we blame it, blame it on somebody and it's not even their fault. Mm. So we have the denial, we have the anger, we have the bargaining. Uh, bargaining is when we, we're trying to make a deal, so to speak, that bargain, that deal, we're trying, we make deals with God. God, if I had done this differently, would this not have happened? Or could you bring them back even, depending mm. on the level of grief and how right. it affects you psychologically? Uh, so you go into a bargaining, kind of and it's also, we call it guilt, where we're bargaining, so if only I had done this, or I should have said this or done this differently, we go into the bargaining, then that can lead into depression, which is kind of an ongoing sadness that prevents us from daily functioning and can be paralyzing, debilitating. And so we go into that where we just, we're stuck there as well, just depressed. And then eventually we get to the state or the phase of acceptance. When that doesn't mean that you're, you don't grieve anymore, it just simply means that you've accepted the reality of it and you're trying to adjust and move forward and trying to go on to the next step. And one thing I'd add to it, uh, Mike, this is so important, what I've seen, is it used to believe, we used to believe that you go from one directly to the other. Mm -hmm. 
you know, graduate from denial, and I, now I'm in anger, and now I'm in bargain, now I'm in depression, and I'll never be angry again. And what we find is not really true, because you actually can fluctuate back and forth from one. You can skip from denial, go straight to depression, and then two years later, go back to anger. Mm -hmm. So it's important for all of us to understand these five stages of grief. We may be in one of the uh, phases here or the stages, but don't be surprised if you're back in there even or repeat it. Even as somebody, if we're walking with somebody through it, like to not even put judgment on the stage that, or phase that they're in, because it just is. There's no way to fast forward it. You just go through it and you're not going to go in in a cyclical way. It's just going to bounce all over the place. Um, do you, do, do people stay stuck in grief and loss in your experience forever? Or how do you get unstuck out of it? Is that, is that possible? Or is there always going to be dates? Like you already have the dates memorized. Is that a hard day for you? Or is that a, how do you not, is that, what's the hope out of that? Yeah, I usually tell people that grief is not something that you get over, you get through it. So I personally believe that grief never completely ends. It's not, you know, the old saying, time heals all wounds. Well, with grief, it's a little different. Maybe it's a scar, but it's something you never forget. Um, and so it is definitely a process and a journey. It's not a 12-step program. It's not, you know, six months and you're better or whatever. It's different for everybody. And I think it's really important that we kind of understand that as we go through the process. And yeah, it's, it's, but it's so different for everybody. So would this be the same with um, like kids and students? I mean, I'm assuming it's the same or what advice would you give and I you know my parenting advice is like be tougher um, but that doesn't work with grief when we're experiencing when students are experiencing loss and grief so is it the same so there are three main categories of how we deal with grieving human beings you have child you have adolescents or teenagers and then you have adults and all three groups process loss differently so a child and back to my situation as a five-year-old seeing my little cat pass you know, I process so different because that was very important and I saw it happen. Mm -hmm. And so it was real different. As a teenager, seeing a friend uh, killed in the motorcycle accident, have another one that, that took their life, you know, though it was processing it so differently, even losing, um, you know, back to the grandfather. But as an adult going through losses, we deal with it differently. So it's important dealing with children, trying to help them navigate it, uh, looking at it differently and not treating them as an adult but walking alongside them, really encouraging them and kind of looking for different signs of how they're processing. A lot of times they'll, they'll do it through art therapy or play therapy. For example, children, uh, teenagers, a lot of times will keep it within and it manifests itself later in other unhealthy ways. Right. And adults do that somewhat as well. So they're all three different, but children definitely grieve. Any outlets that you would say for parents that are like, I don't know how to help my kid or student navigate this? Yeah, so through Mark Ministries, we just started a grief and loss group for children here in Ventura County. Wow. We really had our first one last week. We had five children show up. Parents can come. Grandparents can come. Um, anyone can come for that. It's, it's on a Thursday. If you go to the Mark Ministries website, you can email me. I can send you the address and the date. Right now, it's once a month uh, here in Ventura County. But that's a great way to start uh, to kind of connect with me. I'm also certified in child grief counseling and adolescent grief counseling to try to help these young people. Uh, because it's easy to say, yeah, just, you know, keep going. You'll be okay. It was right. just this. It was just that. Um, but you, you're okay. You're, you're resilient, as we say about children. Right. Not, not so much with grief. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I'd love to stay there for a little bit. Um, I have a ton of questions. But, um, I do have, so Jody and I, in our uh, uh, early 20s, uh, like navigated um, two really, two miscarriages. Um, and I would, shoot, dang it. I wouldn't wish that on anyone, right? Um, and it's still comes up. So, and I did all those phases. I was like mad. I was like, what in the world? I was bargaining. I was like, we are pastors. We love you. We love each other. Like we would be great parents, you know, shoot. Um, so, but we navigated it differently in relationship together. And so I was probably ready to move forward in a more normal normal, like get back to normal life way quicker than she was. So how do you, how do you, like, how would you help navigate? Like, I'm sure that's happened in the room. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, as people are in relationship with friends or 
coworkers or uh, family, that they're just walking through stuff and they're all in different parts of the cycle, but how do you, how would you help navigate that? Like, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So a, a loss such as a miscarriage is what we call disenfranchised loss. The ones that are validated are the loss of a, you know, a parent, a child, or a spouse. But when it's a miscarriage, when it's something that's kind of hidden, so to speak, um, there's not a lot of validation and it's awkward and a lot of uh, couples don't want to talk about it as much. And so I would, re- would say to a couple in that situation, uh, just remember that the wife has had a close relationship with that child before even it was manifested that the child didn't live because it's been inside the womb. So she's going to grieve totally differently mm-hmm. than the husband just because she's been caring. They've been bonded. Yeah. So her grief is going to be different. Um, and everyone, male, female, no matter who we are, we're all going to process things differently. A lot of times men want to fix things and move on. Mm-hmm. I tell people, you don't move on, you move forward with the grief. And in this situation, the wife, it, that would be hard to deal with because there were dreams that she had as well as you, mm-hmm. um, but dreams that she had expecting that and going through those things. And so she had to go through a lot, even physically right. regarding all of that. So her journey is going to be different. Men do want to kind of move forward and kind of get on with it, so to speak, but it's going to be so different. But everybody, I can't stress enough that everybody grieves differently mm-hmm. and they have to go through that process themselves. Yeah. And because we can create a lot of judgment on the other, no matter who it is. It doesn't have to be spouse. It could be friend or work. When I'm like, you should be further along. Why aren't you through it? Or it could be like, why don't you care as much as I care? Because I'm still in the grieving process. You know, um, right. yeah, that's good. How do you, like, if we want to be helpful, how, like, what's a helpful, like, how do we show up? Because everyone in our world is going to navigate grief. Like, that's, we're not escaping it. So everyone's going to navigate grief and loss. So how do we help? How do we show up for somebody that we, that we love? Yeah. So if you, if you love someone or you're going through yourself, especially if you love someone, you know, they're hurting, going through a loss. I, I encourage you, number one, just to be present, uh, be present, be available uh, to them. Um, when I got my certification in chaplaincy, we emphasized the ministry of presence. And sometimes what we tend to do as people on the outside, we want to try to fix somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't fix grief. There really are no words that can change a person who's really grieving and going through a loss. So being available, uh, being present in in them, knowing that that they know that you love them, that you're there with them, uh, praying for them, encouraging them. And I think also being non-judgmental, just really allowing them to go through their process, but knowing that they're safe and that you are an, an encouraging presence. I often say as well, if you have somebody you know that's really struggling going through that, sometimes it's okay to encourage them that they might need to get some help. Yeah. Sometimes what we tend to do is not say anything, and that can also be hurtful as well, just by not saying anything. I've had grievers tell me, I wish somebody would acknowledge my loss or encourage me or have said something uh, positive in my life. So, yeah, I even think showing up and going like, I don't even know what to say, dude but I'm here for whatever you need. Like, it's like, I I think that counts. I mean, showing up to say that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think even I've noticed and I've heard you say, and I think what's been helpful is like any, are there any practical needs that I can take care of? Usually there's a a ton of food and if there's not food, then go get food because they're usually don't eat and they need to have some food around that's Mm -hmm. easy to eat. Or is there an errand that I can run? Can the kids that you need some help childcare? Do you need trash taken out, like just simple things that they're not ready to comprehend or think about can just be helpful. Um, has been something I've heard you say, and I've been able to put into practice in my life. Yeah, it's very true. I was officiating a memorial in uh, Camarillo and it was a mother burying her son and everybody was around, not speaking, not knowing what to do. And she just sat on the front row about 10 minutes before we started her head down and just crying. Mm -hmm. And I just went over to her. I knelt down beside her and I said, is there anything I could get you? would you like a cup of water? Mm -hmm. She said, yes, that would be great. Went and got her. Well, she said, that's exactly what I needed. And that seemed to like, right. She needed somebody to do something instead of say something in that moment. So action definitely helps in that. That's good. Well, but Christians and people in general are notorious for saying the wrong thing. Um, So maybe school me up on what uh, pastorally on what I shouldn't say uh, or what we shouldn't say when we walk into these situations. Yeah, so words are powerful. We always heard, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me, but they actually can. They mm-hmm. actually can. 
And so I encourage pastors and leaders and anyone that claims to be people of faith to really be careful what you say. So um, a couple of things that I suggest not to say is I tell people don't spiritualize it too soon. Um, and that's one thing that I made a mistake of years ago, even in pastoral leadership uh, over on the East Coast, of trying to fix it and saying these spiritual things like jumping ahead and as soon as you find about a loss, saying, well, I, at least we know they're in heaven, or I'm glad they're safe, I'm glad, I'm glad they're, where they, they're with Jesus and all of that. And sometimes spiritualizing it too soon doesn't help the person who's grieving. And I've seen so many illustrations of this uh, throughout my time helping people and it's just, it's really important. Um, also saying the words at least, those two words will minimize. So mm -hmm. I say don't spiritualize, don't minimize. Mm -hmm. Because if I say, if somebody lost a child, for instance, it, will, it would be insensitive of me to say, well, at least you have other children. Yeah. Or at least you can, you're young and you can have, you know, other kids. Or as someone uh, said to my brother's widow, at least you're young and you can get married again. Mm -hmm. Well, that was not helpful. And that was a lady in the church, from yeah. what I understand. So it just you've got to be careful about at least. It minimizes. Write these down, the everyone. So write these down. Write these down. Yeah, that's good. Any others? I mean, just stay away from tips. Um, I use it. My, my, one of my main tips is if you're going to try to speak to somebody, you just find out they had a loss. This could be from pastor or whoever it might be. Let them lead in their expression or verbalization of their feelings. Mm -hmm. Then you can affirm what they said. For example, when I lost my brother, you would come and you, you would come and you would just say, man, I'm sorry to hear about this or whatever words you want to say. Then if I say, well, I'm, I'm just grateful to know my brother is safe in heaven. Then you can say, that is very comforting. I'm so glad we have that mm -hmm. or faith that you'll see him again. But let me say it before you say it always works better. So let the other person lead um, because you never know where somebody is mentally and psychologically mm -hmm. after a loss. Um, I think it's important. And then the last thing I'd say about it is sometimes the best thing to say is not to say anything at all. I've said many times, especially if it's a young, a child that took their life and you can just feel it's in the room. Sometimes I'll just say, I don't know what to say right now. Mm -hmm. Or I'll say no words is a short way of saying, and I'll just hug them. I'll just hold their hand. And I'll weep with them. Even the scripture says weep with those that weep. So sometimes just by being there, loving them, not saying anything mm -hmm. is powerful. Yeah. Man, um, man, this is so good. I'm so grateful for even like your presence and your tone. I know that you've been so helpful to so many people. Um, what encouragement would you give if you just had the, had the room and had the floor and you, in this area? Maybe somebody is navigating grief right now or maybe somebody has friends that are navigating grief right now or loss or maybe somebody hasn't dealt with it and it's been buried back there. Like, what would you say to mission? So the room is yours. My, my first thought would be to say there truly is hope for everyone. I honestly believe that everybody goes through loss where none of us are exempt from it. Some of us, we have losses that have been buried in the past. We call those unresolved issues or hidden grief. And it can manifest in itself in other ways as you grow older and through your life. Um, we've, I've had people come to my groups that lost a spouse 40 years before some tragic when they were younger and they're just now speaking about it, but they found that it has manifested in, 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 in horrible ways through anger and relationships and all kinds of difficulties. Even it affects us physically. A lot of people develop things and it comes through those type of things. So I would just say there is hope for everyone. Um, and there is hope here. I would encourage you to go to the Mark Ministries website. Uh, if, you, if you need immediate assistance for grief and loss, like today, I would say go to the Mark Ministries website. It's simply markministries.com. You can scroll down, subscribe to the YouTube channel, because every week, and we have several video shorts and uh, things on there, and you can subscribe to that. You can go ahead and see some helpful educational things about grief and loss. Um, I'd also say uh, come to the workshop tomorrow night at 6.30. Even, whether you're grieving or you know somebody that's grieving, it would be a great thing to invite somebody and come with them, perhaps. And even if you don't know anybody, I will tell you this, you're going to grieve one day. Mm -hmm. It would be a great way to prepare because they don't have college courses on grief and loss. How yeah. to prepare for this. I would go ahead and get prepared for this. I've had so many people tell me, I'm so glad I came. I wasn't grieving, but now I'm better prepared 
-hmm. for the shock that came in my life. Absolutely. Oops, I just snapped my fingers. Oh, no. But I, I think it's very important. Uh, everybody's still here. Okay, okay. good. So, um, I would, and then I would just also say, too, is come to the grief and loss groups that we have here. Uh, we have it the first and third Tuesday of every month at 430 right here. And it is so powerful. There's a different topic every month. Uh, we Obviously, there's a time of share, sharing and so forth. It's just a great thing. And then, then I just want to say my last thing. Grief hurts. Grief hurts. And I can, do, I can almost feel it in the room here. There's pain here. There's pain here. Uh, November 21st, this last November, two days before Thanksgiving, my, di my dad died suddenly, or not suddenly, he, my uncle died s suddenly after him, but my dad died from cancer uh, two days before Thanksgiving. Six hours later, my uncle died on the same day from a heart attack. Two losses, the slow loss and the sudden loss, the two types of way people die. There's a lot of pain. And so I'm not one of those that just wants to spout off much information. I'm just Paul. I just want to help you because I'm sympathizing, but I'm empathizing with you. And I'm just so grateful that Mission Church has a heart, yeah. not just for those who attend here, but for the community and the world and beyond. And so we're right here with you. There is hope with God, but there's also hope in people. And we're all in this together. And so you're not alone. Yep. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Paul will be uh, hanging with me at Connection Point if you want um, to chat. There also, most of our care team is going to be in the room hanging out. Jen will explain what we're going to do. Um, I think I just want to read some scripture over us. If you'll allow me to pull some help and hope from the, from the spiritual bucket. Not knowing where everybody is in the room. So I'm just start with Revelation 21.4. It says this way. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither sh there sh shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. This is talking about the hope that we have someday in heaven. Psalm 147.3, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. 1 Peter 5.7, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And then maybe my favorite um, funeral text to read from is when Jesus is having a hard time with his best friends on earth and he gives this message and everyone bails on him. It's in John 6. He says this, John 6, 60 says this, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Skip forward a couple of verses from this time. Many of his disciples turned their back and no longer followed him. And then Jesus looks at his boys, his crew, like very human responses, like, you don't want to bail too, do you? Like everybody's leaving. Are you staying? And then Peter has this response that I think is maybe the most hope-filled response. And what I would say is we're navigating grief from the spiritual bucket. He answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So when life hurts the most, I don't know where else to tell you to go than Jesus and the hope that we have in him. Because we have come to believe and know that he is the Holy One of God. Won't you pray with me? God, you are good, and you are great, and you understand our pain, and you understand what we're going through. God, we're not trying to fix it today. We're trying to be honest with it. And if you'll let us, we're trying to take it to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.